on the surface of the implants, what we know is that implants do well if they're rougher and if they're threaded, we get more attachment to bone than we do if they're just smooth and non-coated. The other thing that I look for is why they lose this tooth in the first place. You know, was it decay? Was it was it, was it perio? Yeah. Was it they split a tooth? Because so much of how they lost it to me is going to affect and influence the the predictability of my success. I would argue that regardless of whether the GP is doing it or not, we should be having a conversation about whether you're doing guided surgery or not. And then we should not only be having a conversation about guided surgery, but okay, how are we planning the case? Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast Gygenist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists, episode number 227. My name is Andrew. And this is Michelle. Welcome, listeners. We're glad you're here, and we hope you've subscribed and you told your friends. Andrew, I'm super, super obsessed with this uh, face. I, I know we usually just get into something, but I'm like obsessed with the Southern Mama's Facebook page. <laughs> oh man. I'm glad that's where you went. Cause you said face and then you stopped saying, I'm like, it better not be like a face cream or a face something else. Well, we all know I'm obsessed with my face creams. Yeah. There's a shit. Well, also I love Shit's Creek and there's a, um, in the last uh, season of Shit's Creek, there's, um, a line that David uses and he's like, uh, you have really good skin. And David's like, yeah, I know. It's just my nine step uh, skincare routine that I do twice a day. And I was like, yes, David. <laughs> <laughs> you you see oh, into my no. soul, you know who I am. Also, my neighbor called me out yesterday while I was walking Lola because, you know, now we're quarantined. I'm not going anywhere. And well, not that I ever really did, but now I walk Lola, you know, every morning, every night. And I always have coffee with me in the morning and wine with me. At night. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked past uh, the outside of like the, the, the neighborhood. And so it's behind some houses and he was sitting on his porch and he's like, yeah. You always got your dog and a beverage. I'm assuming that's wine right now. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of glass do you carry it in? In like a wine glass? Actually, there's like tumblers with the lids on it, oh, like yeah. those Yeti kind of tumblers with it. Yeah, no, not a glass because I'm so much <laughs> of a klutz that I can break it somewhere, somewhere. Lola will yank her, you know, I spill it everywhere. I'm a mess. So anyhow. Let's circle back, back to, to your group. Southern Thank Mama. you. There we go. Southern Mama. <laughs> if y'all haven't seen this already, please go watch it. I mean, I could literally watch it every day just just as a pick me up, but I just love it. I think even though it's the Southern accent isn't the same as mine in here in South Carolina, it's like the cadence and the words that I grew up with, not the accent necessarily, but it's like, you ain't got nothing to do. I'll put a dust rag in your hand right now. You want a dust rag? <laughs> I'm like, well, that's how I grew up. <laughs> you ain't got nothing to do. I'll find you something to do real fast. You better get in here right now. And <laughs> Oh my God. I feel like the children of today need a good Southern discussion. Southern mama. In good Southern life. mama. Yes. Yes. We don't need those British nannies coming in and teaching us things. We need some Southern mamas. And I don't know uh, what, uh, you know, what happened in other communities, but in my world, uh, when I was growing up, it was very much, it takes a village because I would have gotten called out by a neighbor real fast. You better get out that tree. You better fall, fall down right now. And I'm like, I'm going to go tell your mom. I'm like, damn it. Like, what? Why, why does everybody see me? I'm just trying to get in some good old trouble here. I'm getting ratted out. <laughs> just trying to be a child. But that, I mean, I grew up on an island where everybody knew where you were, what you're doing, who you're with, when you got home. So yeah, I think we need that. In today's world, we need it. But then like during teenage years, they need to maybe get out of your business a little bit. That actually is more what happened. Like I could be at a gas station and they can get home. And my mom's like, I got a phone call from somebody. What were you doing at that gas station? That's not around the house. And I'm like, damn, what? Wow. Oh, yeah. And I grew up on an island, like not like a super, super small island, but it's, I could ride my bike around this island. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was enough that people were up in your business real fast. Um, anywho, we can get back to this dental podcast of ours. I just thought that that was funny and I'm super <laughs> obsessed with it. And if you haven't already, seen it, you need to go on Facebook yeah. and look at Southern Mamas. Also, I've taken Facebook off my phone. 
so proud of you for doing that. Oh my gosh. How do you feel about that? Um, I actually feel very happy that I've done this. I've also stayed out of some forums for my sanity, but what does feel a little overwhelming is when I do go on my computer and I have like 70 notifications, I'm like, oh, okay. <sighs> do I want to look at these? Most of them are garbage. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody is tagging me in anything, I'm probably missing in. Um, send me a Facebook messenger if it's super important. <laughs> Because that I still have, but that's quite the reverse statement from last week's episode or two weeks ago's episode where you're like, uh, Facebook Messenger, because I have to, because Andrew makes me. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I would prefer text messages from you. Let's just be very honest. But anyhow. So we're starting a new series, Andrew. We are get back into this podcast thing of ours. We're starting a new series. This is gonna be on dental implants. And I can't, you know. I can't believe we haven't done this, but also at the same time, when people ask us, like, how do you keep coming up with content? I'm like, there's 52 weeks still doesn't feel like enough mm -hmm. a year mm -hmm. for us to put one out a week. Like we've learned so many things and things can be, you can just deeper dive into certain subjects. So even if we did talk about caries or cariology, like we could just deep dive into silver diamine fluoride only or mm -hmm. fluoride only or camera only. Like there's just so much to right. all of this. So we're just now getting around to a, a, a series on dental implants and we're going to kick it off with Dr. Sully Sullivan talking about the implant placement. And then we're going to talk about case acceptance with Miranda Beeson. That was such a great episode. And then that's actually what kickstarted you to get your disc assessment. Yep. Yep, which we loved. And then we're going to finish it with Melissa Obratka and we're going to talk about implant maintenance. So I'm really excited for this series. Um, some amazing experts coming on and talking to us. And we're going to kickstart it, like I mentioned, with Dr. Sully Sullivan telling us about the surgical side of dental implants. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode with Dr. Sullivan. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So listeners, um, we love having repeat guests on and we have Dr. Sully Sullivan, which I want to talk about how you got the name Sully Sullivan. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, I would love to know that. But you've been on the podcast before. Um, you have the great podcast, Millennial Dentist. Dentist. Oh, thank you. And so we wanted to bring you on to start off the series on implantology. So welcome. I'm and excited to be here. Give us some... Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for coming back on. This was supposed to happen at Hinman. I know. What a bummer. Well, that got delayed. We were going to share a podcast booth and it was going to be super fun. Uh, oh It'll well. be good, though, because next year, now we've got like a whole year extra year to prepare. And we'll have, True. it'll just be <laughs> totally out of the park. And it, it didn't affect head. me as much. I think you were way more prepared than I was. You had all the guests lined up and Maymon and I were just going to show I up. Mean, and so we didn't you know, have to reschedule anything. That knows me knows that, that that's not surprising. <laughs> like, I need all the details. Yeah. I need to schedule. <laughs> Michelle kept message me and be like, hey, what about this? What this? I'm like, yeah, that works great. <laughs> I'm kind of whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, no, that's, that's like funny. I did this in that regard. But it's funny though. I've actually, uh, you know, it's not many people know me other other than Sully. I've been Sully since like the second grade. So you know, way before the monster, way before the pilot. My, our high school football coach, he got there when I was in second grade. He went to school with my dad back in like middle school or something. Mm -hmm. And at some point, they called my dad Sully for like a year or two in like high school or middle school or something, and it never really stuck. But that's kind of how he knew my family was from that kind of era. And so mm -hmm. he realized that I was him. And so he started calling me Sully. And then if you're second grade and the high school football coach is calling you Sully, like it just kind of stuck. And oh, everybody was like, literally, so cool. yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so I'm like, well, sure. Sully's great. And Richard was a very big name for like, I mean, that would still be a weird, that's so like, true. like, could you ever see me as a Richard? Like that doesn't make any sense. So Sully it is. Sully it is. I love it. So you are a practicing dentist and you are working quite a bit with dental implants, correct? Yeah. So I graduated in 2015 and like, which gosh, I can't believe that's almost in five years. And like, like most dentists coming out of school right now um, and younger dentists, there's definitely a huge desire to do implants. I mean, so mm -hmm. it was definitely something I wanted to get into. So I think 
I got my initial training done in 2016, kind of the summer of 2016, and really hit the ground running. You know, now place probably close to 250 implants a year. So nice. it's pretty crazy. Nice. That is crazy. And then you've also gotten really into the digital side of things. Yeah. So, you know, that was kind of, I guess, such, it was kind of natural, right? Because we talk a lot about, you know, we'll get into this, I'm sure, when we look, talk about implants and kind of how I got into implants and just where you can start. But really pre probably, let's call it like 2015, 2014, maybe even going back to 2013. Before that time, the majority of implants were all placed without comb beam. You know, very few offices had 3D technology. So I think that limited a lot of the, the capacity for people to want to get into them. I never placed one implant without comb beam. So it, it's kind of a different mindset that, that changed a lot of things. So for me, it was a lot easier to get into almost just because it really changes your predictability when you're talking about implants. And so that's kind of a unique thing, I guess, is technology really, I don't know implants without technology. Without it. Yeah. And yeah. Now you can even, you could take that even, you know, ton, tons further. And I'm sure we'll talk about this stuff too with guides and that sort of thing. But, but yeah, when you look at the foundational part of it, I don't think that it's really smart or wise for, my generation, or let's just call it the, you know, 40 and younger right now, who, the people who are going to be in dentistry now, 10, 15, 20 more, you know, we have, we have a pretty mm -hmm. big career ahead of us. I don't think it's wise to get into implants without comb beam. It, I just don't, I just don't see it. To me, so it's crazy. much more. And so I was a surgical assistant and hygienist you know, 15 years ago right. before all of this. And I placed a ton of implants with my docs and it was, it was a, a crapshoot. Like, and the assistant's job was so super important because, you know, you as a dentist, oh gosh, you're giving a different perspective. Things. And yeah. And we were like, mm, I think you need to be a little bit more medial. You <laughs> might want to move that, <laughs> that angle just a little bit more. Yeah. And, you know, we had such interesting things to calibrate our anorexes. And like, so we had to be all very calibrated on how we place the patient in the Panorex machine right. so that we had good information when we went to go place it. It was just a different beast. Now, when I look at these comb beams, I'm like, damn, how do you screw it up? You can't rinse them. You can't well, really try. Yeah. And it definitely, it, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Cause like it definitely, you know, now you see it and you see, okay, well, hey, we got tons of bone. There's lots of predictability. But then a lot of times, then it becomes a decision of like, okay, do I do guided surgery or do I just use this kind of like a mental guide? Right. And, Mm. And that becomes interesting because then you, you talk about, well, if, if I know I can do it with a guide and be here, why would I not be doing that? But those are, those are kind of start to get into more of that, the details of that conversation, you know, from that standpoint. Right. So I guess what we could start with is, you know, patient and let's, we can go with some pretty simple patients, right? Single sure. unit or yep. single tooth replacements, maybe some bridges and things. They definitely get way more complicated where you're doing these fixed cases, right. uh, building bone, replacing. And I, that's the stuff that I was a part of, like taking hip bone and yeah. replacing it. And that was some crazy times, but let's go simple. Let's Perfect. go simple. So like, how do you decide on a good candidate for, let's say single tooth or maybe multi-tooth? Yeah. So, I mean, the reality is if you look at most general dentist practices, if you just take, okay, let's talk about single implants you know, 1930, four, five, first premolars, lower molars, those are pretty, e pretty easy implants to get into. And you look at the amount of patients in our practices that have missing teeth, that's a lot of, a lot of those patients have those missing teeth. So there's, there's a ton of opportunity, even if you stay into a realm of just those kind of more straightforward single teeth. So I think that's a little bit of a, sometimes a misconception is people think, oh, if I'm going to get an implant, so I have to do all these crazy stuff. And the, the challenge there is like we live in like Facebook and Instagram and all this stuff where people like to show all the crazy stuff, whereas really, I'll tell you, the bread and butter majority of the implants that I, I place are those straightforward single implant. So I think there's a ton of opportunity out there. First thing that I kind of look for is, do we have adjacent teeth? And then, and obviously, what's the bone quality like? I think that's the, the mm -hmm. biggest thing. And that's where comb beam, it, it's hard for me not to talk about implants and not talk about comb beam, right? So the very first thing, if you wanted to implant my office, that you're gonna, that's going to happen before I even look in your mouth is I'm taking a comb beam. I mean, literally, that's and that's kind of a part of our new patient experience anyways, is that whether people agree with me or not, every single patient basically that comes into our office that's, you know, of age, it's not like a kid, is going to get a comb beam. 
before I've even seen them, I've kind of already assessed from a hard tissue perspective, is this a case that I feel comfortable with? Is there adequate bone? And, you know, when I say adequate bone, I mean, we're talking probably maybe 10 to 12 millimeters of height where there's no sort of, there's not sinuses, there's not a nerve. You know, you've got 10 to 12 millimeters of just solid, good vertical bone. Mm -hmm. And then you've got about five to seven millimeters of, of horizontal bone, because that's going to allow you to place a three, four millimeter wide implant. That's a 10 millimeter implant long, you know, like a, somewhere in the three, five by 10 or four by 10 range, perfectly straightforward with, with about a two millimeter or three millimeter kind of safety zone around it. That way you've got margin for error. I mean, the, the implants that I wouldn't start placing are the ones that you got 10, 10 millimeters below the science a sinus and you're placing a 10 millimeter implant, right? That's, that's not the, <laughs> the a little too close for comfort. It's not the starter, the starter implant. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then once I do, once I look at that, then obviously I'm making sure that the big thing is just, is the patient medically in a good position to handle mm-hmm. this? Do they have any significant, you know, factors or, or things going on medically that could, that could hinder it? Do they smoke? That's obviously a huge one. You know, one that we don't think about as much is that is actually more and more common. We're seeing failures with is is people who are allergic to penicillin. That's that's Uh somebody that is 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 sometimes a harder case. The other thing that I look for is why they lose this tooth in the first place. You know, was it decay? Was it was it perio? Was it they split a tooth? Because so much of how they lost it to me is going to affect and influence the the predictability of my success. You know, you take upper molars in patients who have lost teeth because they've split them or they're big grinders. And like, I mean, that's a, even if there's a lot of bone, that can be a scary case to do just because of what the forces that are going to go, you know, without it. If they're decay patient, they've had traditionally really good gum, you know, soft tissue, then they can be a really, really good candidate. The, The one thing I probably overlooked the most, and you'll probably appreciate this from a hygiene perspective, was soft tissue. You know, when, when looking at how much attached tissue is there, how much good, solid, keratinized tissue is there, that was probably the, the thing that I looked for the least when I was getting started. I would do like a yeah. lot of tissue punches, trying to be kind of cute with stuff. And then you have a hygienic, you know, issue on the back end with just not having that good tissue around it. So that's, that's the other thing I look for now is, okay, you know, if I had to say, what are the, the three things that make you a good candidate? One is you've got good hard tissue you know, plenty of bone. The other is you've got good soft tissue, lots of attached, you know, good care size tissue. And then the third one is that, you know, you've got a pretty good, you know, lack of medical history or mm-hmm. you're a healthy person. And then, yeah, you're, you're a good candidate at that point. So for the soft tissue, I'm curious, you know, it's been many years since I've been in surgery placing these implants, but we were, it was a little bit easier to manipulate the soft tissue to give more keratinized tissue than let's say bone. So correct. Yeah. Is that kind of well, the case now? Well, you know, yes and no. I think it, I think it more mm-hmm. depends on probably the background of where if individually, right? Some people are, mm-hmm. I'm probably better at hard tissue than I am soft tissue just because I've had more training with hard tissue, right? So right. I feel more comfortable growing bone than I do going to get tissue from the palate or, you know, trying to do a connected yeah. tissue graft. So I think a little bit depends on just what kind of training you have from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that there are easier things you can do to set yourself up for a soft tissue success than, than right. necessarily heart tissue. One of which being, you know, when you start talking about guided surgery, there's a tendency to not want to make these big flaps to just do a tissue punch where you kind of take out, you know, literally like think about like a, for your listeners, like a, like a cookie cutter that you're going to mm-hmm. cut, you know, that cookie out of the dough. You're doing the same thing with tissue. You're just taking a little round circle, cutting that out, but then you're losing all that tissue. Well, that can be a nice conservative way to put the implant in, but if you had made an incision, pushed all that tissue to the buckle, you know, you're really bolstering something up that didn't take you much longer, but has a, has a pretty profound effect long-term on that implant success. So right. th- these are things I didn't think about when I was just just looking at heart tissue, right? Oh, there's plenty of bone. Let's, let's go throw it in there. Mm, that makes sense. So I'm curious. What's the age? So I'm thinking more from a congenitally missing tooth. Mm-hmm. When do you start placing implants? When, like what? And then is that going to be gender specific? Well, yeah, I think so. A lot of times what I'll do with those is I'll have, I'll, I'll talk to the orthodontist because the orthodontist, you know, when they're taking CEPHs, they've got a good, a good idea of when their growth and development's kind of stopped or halted because like the worst thing you could do is be too early. 
you know, because mm-hmm. we've all kind of seen cases where the implant was placed early and then their, their body and their head's grown, their skull's grown around it. And then the, the tooth's in the wrong position and there's nothing you can do. So, I mean, we definitely tend to wait probably, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old before we were mm-hmm. putting, you know, putting in implants, especially in the anterior. I mean, you can get a little way, way with it more in the posterior, but those are ones that I would not start with, right? Like those are the ones right. that I, I, you know, even now I'm like, be careful about so those. Cautious, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> How about your um, elderly patients? You know, elderly patients can do really well. The good thing about typically elderly patients is they don't tend to, I don't feel like they tend to put as much force on them or, or and they tend to listen a little better, I think, than, mm-hmm. than sometimes your 40, 50-year-old patient tends to be a little hard, more hard-headed and just does what they want to do. I've had, I've had a lot of good, of good success with those, with those patients. Honestly, to me, unless it's like an extreme over 90 or like really young, kind of right on that borderline age, I haven't noticed a huge difference between age or even gender. It's more of what is just their overall health right? and that and, yeah. and hygiene. And Habit, then, health, exactly. Those yeah. kind of things tend to make, mm-hmm. I think, more of an impact than are For they sure. 65 or are they 40? Like I haven't seen a big difference in that. Mm, that's good. So I'm curious about the implant sizes. And I know that there's a ton of different implant systems out there and they probably all kind of vary a little bit, but like what, when you were talking about 10 millimeters earlier, like what does that actually mean? Perfect. So obviously take this as my opinion. I mean, you're going to, you'll, there's lots of opinions on implants and I I don't claim to be the, the smartest one by any means, but you know, when you, when you talk about basic implant sizes, you're going to have narrow, narrower implants that are typically for areas where you have narrow roots. Think um, like lower anterior teeth. And then you're going to have larger implants that are typically going to be for, you know, more posterior teeth or take more stuff. Bigger is not always better. I mean, there, there's a certain point to where I think you, you, you gain width and length are good. We look at implant sizes in two numbers, width and length. So a common number, for example, may be a 4.0 by 12 millimeters. That means the implant, implant diameter across the width is four millimeters. And from top to bottom, it's 12 millimeters. So a typical, let's call it like a premolar implant or a single rooted tooth implant is going to be around that three six three eight four zero four two, kind of around that 4.0 average by, you know, 10, 12 millimeters. When we look at vertical components, depending on the literature you look at, most people will say that you really don't gain much by going beyond 11 half or 12 millimeters. So they make 15 millimeter long implants, 18, they can make some pretty long implants, but you don't like, necessarily... What is it, like 40 or for some well, of the zygos? So the zygos, again? yeah, they're like, they basically Ooh. go up to like your ears almost. Pretty but, much, it's like a house screw. You no, know, exactly. It does. But yeah, the typical, my most common probably implant I use is a 4.2 by 12 or a 4.2 by 10.5. I mean, literally, mm-hmm. I, could, I could probably get away with like 80% of my implants like that. Now, if I'm going back to a molar or, you know, you may use more of like a 4.8, a 5.0, and then they go, they go as low as, as, you know, about three millimeters in diameter there. As far as, as the width goes from an important standpoint, you definitely don't want to put a 3.0 in a molar. Like that isn't very advantageous. And you don't necessarily want to put a 5.0 or a 4.8, like a wider implant in, in a number eight, for example, just because there's enough bone to support it. So you really want proportional size to proportional bone. So just to kind of give you an example, let's say you have a, a, um, a site that has six millimeters of bone in width, okay, and 12 millimeters of bone in height. So you've got, what, four by 12? Mm-hmm. Okay, in a uh, bone. So in that situation, I may put like a three five by ten. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm maintaining because what I use what, what what some people will do is they think I'm going to stick the biggest screw in the hole that I can I can do right. They're like, okay, well I can if I can fit a four eight, I'm fitting a four eight. But there's definitely a a lot to having good quality of bone and therefore good quality soft tissue around the implant. So you don't necessarily always want to put the biggest size that you can. And this is where, again, where comb beam is so, so incredible because without comb beam, you're kind of guessing based off the pan, based off what you see intraorally, you're having to measure stuff. And so you, you don't know exactly what implant you're going to use before you get in there. Whereas the majority of all these implant softwares, you literally go in there and 
click a button and drop in the implant, and then you can click a button and change the size, length, width, et cetera. So when I'm placing an implant, I pretty much know it's going to be this size or a little bigger for some reason if it's like a rest, you know, like the bone quality is not great and I want to use a little bigger implant. But other than that, you know exactly what you can do, you know, prior to even placing the implant. And there are all kinds of different ones. And these are definitely going to be more of the outliers, but like your mini implants. Yep. Like, what does that actually mean? So, and and I I won't get too much into the, to that stuff. Obviously, I mean, I'm okay with not being politically correct. Here's my thing. There are a lot of alternative <laughs> implant solutions that are maybe more cost-effective for the doctor or therefore cost-effective for the patient. I'm one of those people that's like, if we have X product and X product is proven to work for a long time and it works really good and has great research and great literature and it costs a little bit more, but it's going to provide me that kind of predictability. Why would I, why would I try to reinvent the wheel? So some people right. have a lot of success with mini implants, which are just really tiny implants. A lot of them aren't even threaded. You just kind of tap them in. And now they have really short implants. That's another big thing that are really short uh-huh. and fat. So you can kind of put them in, in places where there's not a lot of height. Well, to me, yeah, you could do that. Or you can kind of identify maybe what the problem is in the first place, right? Like there's not enough bone. So the real problem is not compromise your implant by using a short one. It's we need to grow more bone to put maybe the implant we want to put. So that's that's a nice thing about, again, going back to the digital thing, of just being able to know, hey, this can work. We can use a short implant, but ideally we would grow some more bone first so we could put an ideal implant in. So we don't tend to place a lot of minis or a lot of short implants just because, again, I'm kind of shooting for the most most predictable thing I can do. Right. And I started seeing recently, well, you know, one of my first implant cases that I ever had to maintain as a hygienist was one was a blade and one was a ramus bar, Right. which for the audience that literally when that person took out their denture, I was like, is this the Terminator in my No joke. It was very crazy because it literally was just the bar that followed the whole entire ramus. It was very interesting. But then the blade was actually screwed into the outside of the jawbone. Mm-hmm. And I see that that's becoming a thing again. Yeah, I think it's... Age almost looking ones that it, sit on top of the, the we can. What's cool, obviously, is because of our ability to like have a three-dimensional view of it with comb beam and then be able to 3D print these models, we can actually... Because it used to be what they would do with blades and these type of things that kind of wrapped around the jaw was mm-hmm. they would basically fillet them out so that you could see the entire mandible and then take an impression and then mm-hmm. stitch them back up and then go, go back, make what you need to make and then bring them back another time to actually install this thing. Well, now we can do all this on the front end and build these things. And so for some people, they worked really well. The only reason we got away from them was just because it was very invasive. I mean, and surgery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, but for, for patients who you know, you're kind of your chronic denture patient who's been a denture since they were 30 Mm -hmm. and now they're 55 and they want implants. Well, there's no bone and there's no, and that's where I think those kind of come back into play. I still don't think we're going to see them like as common as we see. Yeah, Yeah. by any means, but it is interesting to see them kind of re re coming back on the the market. Mm. So I was just curious about that. So I would love to know like the anatomy of an implant. Okay. Because now we talk about, we used to have these cylinders yep. that we would tap in and now they're threaded. Yep. And then each type from, you know, each company, I guess, has like their secret sauce on the of outside. Course. So yes. Some, <laughs> yes. These, you know, etch, but they're all rough, correct? Right. Yep. Okay. So, so tell me a little bit more about them. Yeah. So basically, and this goes, I think some of it's marketing. I think some of it's whatever, but on, on the, on the surface of the implants, what we know is that implants do well if they're rougher and if they're threaded, we get more attachment to bone than we do if they're just smooth and non-coated. So the other thing that one of the reasons that I think people like threaded is because whether the threading actually adheres to bone better or not, it gives the dentist really good positive feedback because that implant tends to torque in kind of like you would be torquing in like a screw into wood versus into drywall, right? right? Like, you put a screw in drywall, it's like spinning versus if you put it in good wood, it's like you can feel that thing torquing in there. So one aspect is, is 
we as dentists like that feeling because it's like, oh, this is going in well, and that's that's good. We get good initial primary stability. Now, when it comes to the actual coating and surface of these, it's hard for me to say because, you know, the best thing to do is try to look at independent research. I mean, every single mm-hmm. implant company is going to have their research of their implants and how they work really well and they last really long, yada, yada, yada. They're the best. The They're best. the best. Yeah. You know, I've placed probably seven or eight different implant companies and I have, and, and honestly, it all really comes down to personal preference. I haven't seen a significant difference in integration, bone loss, you know, long, I mean, gosh, I've only been placing them three, four years, so I'm not a great person on longevity. But if I look at, I talk to people um, like Mike Picos, who's an oral surgeon who places all the implants and, you know, and you see, okay, what, when they've placed different implants, have they seen a significant difference? You know, I've, one of my places, BioHorizons, they have what's called laser lock, which is just this kind of laser engraved coating on the outside of the implant. That's kind of their big thing. I place a lot of Neodent. Their, their bigger ones actually come in like water. So they're, they're hydrophilic. So when it, mm. you put the implant in, blood kind of like is attracted to the implant. Okay. They all have different, you know, Strom and Nobel both have their, their kind of coatings and different stuff. So, but, but yes, t- to your point, when you look at the anatomy of the implant, you have a, a horizontal width component, you have a vertical component, then you have the, the outside coating or threading. Some are tapered, so they're wider at the top, narrow at the bottom. Um, that's going to be like Nobel Active, BioHorizons like that. And then you're going to have some implants that are parallel. So same width at the top versus the bottom. That's like AstroTech. And so again, just different variations for different purposes. The other mm-hmm. aspect of it too is again, what's the implant designed for? So cer- you know, there's now, we're even seeing a push in um, zirconia implants, or like ceramic implants to, because of how well it does around soft tissue that maybe... Maybe we're going to start using those implants, even though titanium's worked really well. Maybe we'll use zirconia more in the anterior because the soft tissue does so well with those implants. Or for people who like to do full arch surgery, they may like neodent because the connections are all the same. You know, so that's kind mm-hmm. of the next thing we talk about is okay. Well, once you've got the the outside of the implant, how does the implant actually connect to a tooth? And that is probably the most annoying part of anything you do yes. in implants is, <laughs> is the connection. And basically what I mean about that is just like you have Phillips head screwdrivers, straight screwdrivers, you know, Allen wrenches and stars, you have all the exact same thing for implants. Yeah. So unfortunately, they all can't get along and just have like, you know, a Phillips head. Universal one. Yeah, that, that would be, be so great. So you've got... You know, 050, 048, Star, you know, Strauman has a proprietary one. Nobel has a proprietary one. You got all these different connections as far as drivers goes that actually screw them them into the implant. And then, and the other thing that's different is that connection can be, for some of them, it's a hex. So when the, the abutment or the tooth or however you want to call it connects to the implant, it's got just six slots that it snaps into. Um, Mm -hmm. some of them are conical where there's multiple different rate regions. And then some even have it where they'll only seat in one exact position because of the way the abutment's angled and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it definitely starts to get more complicated in that regard. And that's probably what my, my team gets the most frustrated with is when we start playing around with different implant companies is you're like, okay, it's easy to understand. Okay. There's different sizes. Like, okay, this one's a four, six by 12. This one's a four, four by 12, but like we're pretty much the same thing. And they've each got their special coding, whatever. That's fine. But then when you talk about, okay, how do they connect? What parts and pieces do I need to order for the impressions and all that? That's where it gets to be kind of frustrating because if you play around with a lot of different implant companies, you've got a lot of different connections. Right. Yes. And then that makes it harder for like you to have a patient come from, let's say, another part of the country or another country altogether, and then having to guess what their parts and pieces are if they have like a, a failure or a breakage of some sort. No, you're exactly right. I have a lady um, that um, whenever we get through with all this stuff and get back in there that we're going we're gonna to do a two locator overdenture. She's had these implants for like 15 years. She got them placed in Miami. So we now have to track down what type of implants they are, what size they are, what's the connection so that I can then order the parts and pieces. So, so it's a pretty big pain in the butt. And that's honestly, that's one big reason I think that a lot of general dentists want 
are moving towards placing these straightforward single implants just because, you know, it's really nice to know, okay, we place X company, I got these different sizes, we got this connection, and you know, completing it start to finish in your office is just so much easier. Otherwise, we're having to constantly call back and, and figure out, okay, you know, what is it? You know, and then we're a CEREC office, so like we like to restore everything with CEREC that we can. And so then it gets even more complicated because some implant companies can't be restored with CEREC or can't be restored mm. digitally. So then we're having to order other parts and pieces that we wouldn't normally order. And so is it still pretty common to like let cover up an implant and let it heal? Or is it also maybe 50-50, like it comes up and you have a temporary or a healing abutment? What are those parts and pieces? And like, what's yeah, the protocol for Yeah, that's a great question. That? So obviously once, there's kind of a couple of different ways where we'd place an implant, right? One is that we place an implant in a healed site where there's a missing tooth. We're going to go in there, make an incision and place the implant um, and then go from there. The other is, is an immediate situation where we're going to take a tooth out and we're going to place the implant that same day. We see a lot more of that these days just because you know, patient's time, being able to get the implant in there one time. Traditionally, what we look for is if we're doing an immediate implant where we're, we're taking out a tooth, adding bone, doing all this and, and placing the implant, traditionally, we cover them up. And what that means is we put a, a, a little cap screw on top of the implant that's flush with the implant that will literally sleep underneath the, the soft tissue. Sometimes even some bone will grow over it for three, four months while we let it heal before we, we start to start the restorative process. If we're going back in, uh, if we're doing it on an edentulous site, okay, where, where there's, there's already a tooth missing, and traditionally in that case, the bone quality is pretty good. If we can torque the implant in and, and then and just, you know, to kind of back up a little bit, when we put these implants in, we actually get a value of stability. There's two different kind of values that people go off. One is just your torque value, okay? And that's in Newton centimeters. And what we would like to see is somewhere in like the 30 to 35 range. If we get that kind of stability, then we'll go ahead and put a healing abutment on, which is essentially a bigger cap. So that way you can see the implant and soft tissue goes around it so that you now don't have to numb them up or make any incisions or anything like that at the back cat when you restore it. So that can be really nice. I will tell you, Michelle, what we're seeing is more and more of a desire to put the implant in and get some sign of kind of connection in there that allows us to not have to go back to the implant to disturb it. And so the negative to putting a cover screw on, the one that's flat on the implant, is that when you, when you go to uncover, you've got to make an incision or a tissue punch, and you're really disturbing the biology that's taking place at the crest of the bone and implant connection. Because of that, then you're opening up, you know, to bacteria and that seal that's there. And so you're kind of, you're now opening up yourself for more potential bone loss after that period than if it was just the day it was connected, the tissue connected to that implant, it was connected. And so with a healing abutment, at least you're, you're not necessarily, when you take that out, you can see the implant and there's still some, you're still opening it back up to have some, you know, bacteria, whatnot. Not get as in it. severe. Yeah, but it's not as severe as you, you know, pulling tissue that's attached to the implant off that neck of the implant. So or off the bone and exactly yeah. all that stuff. So, so you Very really, curiosity and everything. Yeah. We're definitely moving more and more and more towards trying to at least get a healing abutment on there because then. I feel so much better about that implant being kind of nice, tucked away. I feel like we see less bone loss on that. And now you're seeing, uh, like Nobel is the big one right now, where you're seeing implant companies go towards kind of a, a one abutment one time, which basically means that that abutment that we put on that day can be used as part of the final. You're never messing with the biology of the, of the implant bone soft tissue interface once the mm -hmm. implant's placed. And I think long-term, we're going to see more and more of that kind of style. Which makes sense. Okay. I'm going to talk about surgery. Like what does an actual single yep. unit implant look like? Perfect. Typically, let's say if you are having to flat back the surgery. Yep. Okay. So let's take number 19. That's a pretty common, mm -hmm. should be, you know, great quality bone. It's an easy graft. So let's say we've taken this tooth out, somebody did, and it's been grafted and you got this nice wide ridge of, of bone. It's the ideal situation to, to place an implant. 
And I'll kind of walk you through it two ways, I guess. I'll walk you through non-guided okay. and then kind of guided because I think that's Perfect. that's important. But first thing we're going to do is we're going to take comb beam on the patient. So we've got the comb beam. So now we can we can digitally place this implant. We can see where the nerve is. And we know exactly, for the most part, what size implant we want to use. So I've already got the implant and patient shows up. And then now we kind of make the, or we have the option of, okay, do we sedate the patient? Do we not sedate the patient? I will tell you that for most single unit implants being placed, sedation is somewhat overkill. You numb them up, maybe even some nitrous or something like that. Most patients will do totally fine with doing a single unit implant there. Now, having said that, I think where sedation is probably the nicest is for the doctor, just because it can make it a little <laughs> yeah. less nerve wracking on them because the patient's sleeping. Mm-hmm. Huge advocate for sedation. I, I got my oral conscious sedation as soon as I graduated dental school. Nice. And then I got IV sedation last year. So we do a ton nice. of sedation in our practice. Um, I think it, y- y'all will talk about case acceptance, I think, later, but it is probably one of the number one things that helps seal the deal in a lot of cases is that patients, I mean, I close with, hey, you get to come in, sleep through the whole thing, and you're going to wake up and be done. And that's a big selling point just because so many people are, are scared of that process. So typically, they're going to be sedated in my office, um, and then we numb them up. Our hygienists numb in Tennessee, so they're typically the ones that, that numb them. You know, we numb them no differently than we do for an extraction of a lower molar or really even a crown. Um, in some cases, you really could get away with just infiltrating, but we still tend to block our, block our patients. So we block the patient and then let them get good and numb, and then we're ready to go. So the surgery from a non-guided standpoint basically involves making a midline incision, straight across from the the distal of, let's call it, distal of 18, I mean, excuse me, the mesial of 18 to the distal of 20. So just a midline incision there. And then we wrap that incision in like a C-shaped fashion around the mes- or the, the buckle and the lingual of kind of to the midline of those teeth on 20 and 18. So at that point, then you can, you can then remove the tissue straight up from that midline incis- incision and have a really good view of the, of the bone quality there. Depending on what you see on the comb beam, what you see in, in real life, that's sometimes a, an, an awesome opportunity to then take some rongeurs or a burr mm. and really flatten down that ridge right there just to have a really nice flat ridge to place the implant. Nothing crazy, not taking a lot of bone away, but just making it to where it's nice and smooth because uh, that can definitely help, help from that standpoint. Um, at this point, then it's a matter of of drilling your osteotomies. And so the osteotomy is what we call kind of the, the pilot drill and the drills that follow it. The, that's what we call the hole that those drills create. I was taught super old school and I, I love it from a standpoint of, of the first thing I do, no matter what size implant I'm placing, if I'm ever freehanding it, is I drill to six millimeters, which is a pretty shallow depth. And I put a pin in there with some floss tied around it and I take a PA. So, you know, that way I'm checking to make sure, okay, I look like my angle's fine, but, you know, am I headed towards the wrong tooth? You know, where am I in relation to the nerve? It's a, just a great, you know, and even if today, having placed hundreds of implants, if I'm freehand one, I still do that same step, just because there's no reason not to kind of make sure, hey, I'm going in the right place. And because if you're doing it at six, seven millimeters, you still have an opportunity to correct that in the following drill sequences. So at that point, then I'll continue to drill through, you know, and each drill is a little wider. Typically, you're looking at probably three, four drills. A pilot drill is typically a two millimeter wide drill, two, maybe two, six, three, two, four, six, something like that. And then you're going to place your implant. So once you've drilled all the osteotomies, there is a dummy implant that most kits come with. So you could place that in there and then take again an, a, a, another x-ray just to see, okay, I love the position of the, of the implant prior to putting it in. Obviously, once you start to put the implant in, the less you can then mess with it in and out, in and out, it's ideal. So it's just nice to kind of to do that, especially when you're getting started. And then we, we place the implant. There's two ways to place the implant. One is using the, the handpiece itself. And there's a little driver on there that basically spins and torques it. And the other is you could take it out and then and actually hand, hand torque the implant in. Typically, what I do is I use the, the handpiece to take it about three quarters of the way in, and then I'll finish it so I can see exactly where the depth of the implant is related to the bone with, with the hand torque. One thing to consider is that depending on the implant, the, most manufacturers have a recommendation of whether they want that implant, the top to be at the bone level or slightly below the bone, what we call subcrestal. So that's something to, to think about too is, okay, where do we want the final 
platform of the implant to be relative to, to the bone. And at that point, based off the stability of the implant going in, you know, if we achieve that 30, 35 Newton centimeters number, then I'm typically going to put a healing abutment on. Healing abutments are wider and taller. So think about maybe like a three, five millimeter wide kind of platform looking screw that connects to that implant. That way, when I, when I stitch the person, the patient up, the, the tissue kind of snugs up around that implant, I mean, around mm-hmm. that abutment. And so it heals really nicely to that. So when I uncover it, I, it's just a matter of unscrewing that, that piece. Perfect. And so how long are they typically going? Is it about three to four months still with that little healing abutment? <clears throat> yeah, a lot of that depends on bone quality. You know, if, if they're young, healthy, great bone, I don't mind usually starting it at three months. I'll tell you though, the more and more I place, if I can sneak it to four months, I'll do it. It's, it's crazy just kind of what the quality of bone does between the three and the four month mark. And I'll tell you, especially on grafting from a standpoint of when you've taken out the tooth and you're waiting for that bone to heal, it's amazing the quality of bone, how much stronger it is at four months than it is at three months. So I think getting to that four month mark is, is nice. Um, if you can do it, just sometimes patients are, you know, rearing, they're like, Oh, it's three months. Let's get me in and go. So you I know, want a tooth. I want yeah, a tooth you know, now, you try not to let totally. that affect you too much, but it does. Sometimes. Um, yeah. And then, and then as far as like postoperatively, typically we're giving them a steroid shot. We give them dexamethasone phosphate in the shoulder and that just helps with swelling, inflammation, you know, any, you know, you always want to keep swelling down when you're talking about sutures and whatnot, just because it doesn't pull on the tissue as much. And then we, we still give antibiotics pretty routinely when we're placing implants. And, and, and the hard part about that is, gosh, the antibiotic thing is a little bit of a loaded discussion, obviously, <laughs> there. A lot of it sometimes is on some level a CYA thing, you know? I mean, it's a it's you trying to set yourself up for success and eliminate any of the negative things that could happen because if for some reason an implant fails and you didn't do that, then the patient's like, why didn't you put me on antibiotic? You know, it's just, so that, that's a challenge, I think, to deal with. I will tell you, uh, postoperatively, though, from a pain standpoint, we we probably never give, hardly ever give narcotics away for single implants. You know, the reality is, is, is ibuprofen and Tylenol for a single implant. Most of them will take a little ibuprofen that night and they're fine because the only really, only really painful part of that is the soft tissue healing because there's not a lot of innervation in the bone. So that actual part of the implant isn't, isn't really painful. So postoperatively, single implant patients, I mean, they do really, really, really well. All the years that I did it, most people complained about the extraction yeah. and the implant. They were like, yeah, I went to work the next day, not even a question. I was like, oh, it was a little sore. I had a what, what, no nuts, no chips, none of that. But for the most part, they were like, mm, no problem. No. And, and the, the beauty for us is, and why I just think it's so important that so many offices are getting into this, is that like patients want this type of dentistry, right? I mean, patients know about implants. They know what an implant is. They know that, hey, it's a way to get a tooth back. And so I love doing dentistry that patients want to do, you know, because it's just easier. They don't, they don't balk about fees as much. They don't, you know, they're kinder to us. And so it's definitely something that, <laughs> you know, it's it just, I love plays. I mean, and the time thing, I mean, from a single implant standpoint, it doesn't take that long. Now, that's the, the, the traditional approach, right? The guided approach is, I think, even better. And I, I would say now we probably do 80% of our cases guided. My goal is to get that to 100%, just working that way. But with a guided approach, the, the, the big difference is that once we've gotten the comb beam, we're then also going to need some sort of a digital impression. And so you can get that with either, you know, any sort of intraoral scanner. It doesn't really matter. You know, we have Seric, obviously, but, you know, Trios, Medit, Carestream, there's, there's tons of different scanners. So you need an intraoral scanner, and then that data is going to mesh with the comb beam data and allow you to digitally place the implant, plan where you want the implant placed, and then make a guide based off that position. So then surgery looks really the pretty much the same thing, except for I'm not taking those check x-rays, or and the process is usually much quicker, just because once the guide's on, it's I joke all the time when I'm, when I'm talking to dentists, it's like, okay, I'm going to put this guide on and then you're going to drill through the hole. And then I'm going to take that out and you're going to switch drills and you're going to drill through the hole. And then we're going to do that two more times. And then you're going to put an implant on the drill and you're going to drill through the hole. Like, and not to like oversimplify it, but it's like, 
<laughs> that's it. <laughs> like, try and complicate it. <laughs> and that's really that, like, the thing we talked about at the very beginning, where as an assistant way back in the day, I was like, the, I'm in charge of mesial distal. You're in charge of facial lingual. Right. And this is kind of doing it for you because. I mean, we thought we were on a few times and we take an x-ray and I'm like, oh, didn't see it going that angle. Didn't see that. <laughs> well, and and, it, and even with 3D, like free handing, sometimes that happens. And th- there's just two places that really makes a big difference. One is being the restorative doc, you have to deal with your, your not placement of perfect, that right? So yeah, so one is like you restore enough of your own implants that aren't in perfect position. And you're like, hey, this is silly. Why, am I, why am I not using guides, right? That's one uh, component to it. And the other is just like, gosh, predictability, not having to stress as much. It definitely makes the whole process faster. And so guided surgery is really, really nice. Well, you bring up a good point that you are placing it on and also restoring it. So how does that process look when there is a surgeon in the game, throw in a periodontist in the game and a general dentist? Because then it gets a little... (laughs) Yeah, it could be a beautiful collaboration or it could be a hot mess. Yeah, obviously, I'm probably a little biased to this uh, being the the person who does it all. I'll kind of give you two perspectives. Uh, Let me give you from the doctor's side and I'll give you from the patient's side. Uh, From the doctor's side, I think that to your point, it can be a beautiful collaboration when it's is done correctly. I think the hard part is that most general dentists who don't place the implants don't have a good enough dental implant IQ to lead the story. And I think that's part of the hard part is typically when you look at when we use collaborative specialists, Mm -hmm. the general dentist really should be the quarterback kind of helping, you know, connect and help make some decisions. Essentially, we're just using specialists for their expertise in their specific areas and to kind of execute those, those, those things. So I think a lot of times what will happen is the general dentist kind of takes more of a passive approach. And so then you kind of get the the surgeon doing their thing or the periodontist doing their thing. And then that doesn't necessarily get communicated back well. And so then you have, it, it can just be a little confusing, messy, right? As to, okay, what yeah. part was this? Were they, were they doing the abutment or are we doing the abutment? And so, you know, when I've done it with those cases, it's really the nicest to, to work with specialists who are kind of direct and, okay, here's kind of the way I've done in the past. How would you like to do it? You know, that are open to kind of hearing, but then also what they're really doing is saying, I want to plan. You know, they're, they're kind of saying, I'm less worried about whether you're the quarterback or I'm the quarterback. I just want us to have a plan. And when, you, when, when those conversations take place, there's a much better outcome versus just sending the patient to the specialist and then them coming back with an implant. That's, that's and you dealing with whatever that result is. Exactly. And so, mm-hmm. because I, I would argue that regardless of whether the GP is doing it or not, we should be having a conversation about whether you're doing guided surgery or not. And then we should not only be having a conversation about guided surgery, but okay, how are we planning the case? You know, one thing we haven't really touched on that's an important aspect of digital technology and guided surgery is that we really have an opportunity to plan the implant placement with the end in mind. So traditionally what happened a lot lot is that we would send a patient to the surgeon they would either take a 3D or not, it didn't really matter, but they would place an implant based off where the bone was, where the hard tissue allowed the implant to go, they would place it. Well, that they really didn't take into consideration necessarily, or maybe as much as we should, does that position work restoratively, like where the tooth needs to be? Just because the bone's there, does the, is that where the tooth needs to be? And so now we can really plan with, okay, here's where I want, as a restorative dentist, here's where I need the tooth to be. Can you place an implant there that will work with that? And if you can't, then that means we need to grow more bone or grow more tissue or whatever it is. So I think that's definitely something that's important is to to really plan with the end in mind, especially anterior teeth, because it's all about, okay, where do we want this tooth to be? And then biologically, where does the implant need to be to accommodate that? that tooth. So but I'm very much in benefit or believe in that, that who, whoever's leading it, whether it's the general dentist or the surgeon, that there should be a, a solid discussion about the plan prior to it happening. No, that makes sense. And the end result could be something that's not aesthetically pleasing or right. cleansable. And that's a whole other factor that I think is finally getting its attention that's been due for a while, totally. but for a long time, like as a hygienist, I'm like, how the 
constipation clean in this. Thing. Well, what people don't realize is the easiest part of this implant process is getting the implant to stick in the bone. I mean, that is that is by far the easiest part is to get an implant to integrate with the bone. The hard part is, okay, is it in the right position to restore it? Is the restoration designed appropriately? And is the soft tissue affected by all those things? And those are the hard parts. And so it just, there has to be these discussions on the front end. Otherwise we end up a problem. And, and the negative as the GP and the hygienist and that team of not having those conversations is once you put that tooth on it, you know, you own the problem. And now it's your, it's your tooth. So the thing I would love just to touch on in our final few minutes is the restorative process. Yep. And you mentioned that there's the possibility and we might hopefully see the uh, parts and pieces be something that's more, it stays there versus taking one off, putting it back on. Cause we are breaking that seal every time we right. torque it off. And I've torqued a few of these healing abutments off and the implant came with it, which was real fun. And obviously it didn't integrate, but when we are going to take that healing abutment off, let's say that it isn't one of those parts and pieces that's going to stay there. Like then what, what are we doing is what's the next step in the restorative process? And let me give let me go back on one thing too, because I want to touch base on one, on the other big aspect of kind of that, do I use specialists? Do I learn to do it? That sort of thing mm -hmm. is the patient's view of things. And, oh, good. Yeah. And I did want to touch on that because to me, what we don't think about a lot is what it's going to look like for a patient to say yes to treatment when they've got to go to three different locations, multiple visits, you know, yada, yada, yada. So like, I'll play the game all the time with it. Okay. In a traditional office that doesn't place implants, appointment one, patient comes to you and they want to get an implant. So you say, okay, well, I'm going to refer you to the surgeon to take the tooth out and then they're going to let them do it. Okay. So that's Appointment two, they go get the tooth out. You know, appointment three, they got to go back to get the sutures out. Appointment four, they may come back to you. Appointment five, they're going to the implant. You see how this can get so drawn out and long. Right. Whereas sure. if, if it's all being done in the general dentist's office, then you can literally cut down to as many as two, three appointments to get the entire mm -hmm. process done. So, and then when you do that, that has exponential benefits to you know, patients telling other patients about it and like, well, gosh, my process was not near as bad as that, you know? <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. again, it can be, it can be, there can be a lot of benefits to, to that from that standpoint, the restorative part. So once you've got, and, and Michelle, what, tell me again, exactly what you want me to touch on. So the, when you take that healing abutment off, yep. what's, next? what's next and what, where, because I know there's a lot of nuances to abutments or maybe there used to be, is that the same? Uh, yeah, let's same just, thing? let's, let's simplify it. So mm -hmm. once you've uncovered the implant, there's basically two things that get the patient to a tooth. There's an abutment, okay, which connects the, the tooth to the implant and then you have the tooth. So there's multiple ways that you can get those, but essentially that's the basics that you need is something to connect the tooth to the implant and then you need the tooth. So obviously the crown can be made out of a number of different materials, zirconia, Emacs, you know, it could be made out of a lot of things. And then the abutment can be either a stock abutment, which is just going to be a prefabricated abutment that's cheaper that the manufacturers make that come in different sizes, or it's going to be a custom abutment that's made specifically for that situation. So regardless of what you're using, typically the way it works is when you uncover the, the implant, you're going to take an impression. There's three ways to take that impression. You can use a closed tray impression, which basically means you screw something on, take an impression, take the impression out, and nothing comes off. An open tray impression, which is the ideal impression, where you, you screw onto the implant, then you take your impression, and then you unscrew the abutment prior to removing the impression. So the actual abutment comes out in the impression. That's the most accurate way to do it. And the third way is you do a digital impression, which is how we do 95% of ours, where you screw on a, a scan marker and then you take a digital impression just like you would for a crown and you fabricate it that way. At that point, based off what, you, your, what your impression looks like, you can decide whether you need a stock abutment or a custom abutment to make that. And obviously then, then at that point, you can use a lab. A lot of the digital systems now can be made, th those can be made in the office. Nice. Very nice. And then they get their tooth. They get their and tooth. Oh, that's the, the other thing. The other, mm. the other aspect of it is there's two types of crowns. 
One is screw retained. Mm, good point. Yep. Which mm-hmm. means that the tooth is cemented to the abutment. So it goes on as one piece and then it's screwed in through the top. And then we have to put uh, maybe some Teflon tape or something to, to cover the screw access hole and then composite. Um, that's by far the most, you know, biologically best way to do it from a hygiene perspective because there's no cement being left. It also gives us great access to, to retrieve, to take it off, to look at things if we need to. The most common negative to that is the screw loosens. So then you gotta, mm-hmm. you got to go in there and tighten the screw. Um, and aesthetically, sometimes that doesn't, doesn't look as good because you can see the access hole typically access in, hole, in yeah. some comparison or compared to not having it. And then the other, other way is you, is you screw in the abutment first. And then at that point, it literally acts just like a traditional crown prep where you could then scan that or, and you cement the, the crown onto the abutment. Negative of which being obviously is trying to you know, clean up as much cement as, you can, as, as possible. Because the cement can be the killer of many implants. It can. Cement's yeah. probably one of the number one killers. Yeah, for sure. And then they go into maintenance for us hygienists to maintain and make sure that they can clean it effectively and, and hopefully last for many, many years. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at that, you know, I, I'll definitely, I actually would, would have to listen to the, the maintenance one y'all do. You know, there, there's, there can be lots of challenges with implants. It contacts t- can open up with with implants, which can be obviously a, a, a huge issue. Everyone knows how big of a you know issue open contact can be. You know, occlusion can be tricky with implants. It acts like a tooth, but it can definitely be different from a standpoint of how the patient approaches it with flossing and, and that sort of thing. So it definitely creates challenges. You know, I tell patients all the time, like implants are amazing, but you know, there's still it still has its own its own challenges. For sure. Yeah, you know, the maintenance one is going to be really great with Melissa. And there's been a lot of changes in maintenance since I started, you know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago with implants. And whereas I used metal instruments or I just did whatever I could do. And now I'm, my goal is never to put a scaler to an implant. It's all about biofilm management. And hopefully the majority of that's going to be done at home. And, you know, that looks different for every single implant, every person, everybody's lifestyle and level of motivation. So that's, but, you know, the thing that I always get to in my courses is the conversations you have before the placement of implants right? and hopefully identifying people's level of motivation and for them to also understand their accountability, not just in the home care side of it, but like sometimes they might have to come to the you know, appointments more frequently, right. maybe if they are higher risk or become higher risk, you know, they were coming every two or two times a year. Now they need to come four times a year just because they're, they now have uncontrolled diabetes or something like that. And just so they, I mean, the chances are of them remembering all those details five down, years down the road is, you know, not that great, but at least you've had that conversation right. and, you know, you can be like, yeah, remember when. <laughs> First things I always do in consults and when I was trying to really help the patient identify what, what got them here in the first place. Like really mm-hmm. doing a little so bit of good. like a retrospective look of, okay, why, why did you lose this tooth? You know, was it, was it decay? Was it gum disease? Was it fracture? You know, was mm-hmm. it trauma? Like what ultimately got you here and what are we going to be doing differently? That's going to make this tooth work. That you makes know? a lot of sense. And, yeah. And so mm-hmm. I think it definitely gives the patient, cause, and I'll tell them like, look, if you're not going to change your habits or you think differently, this probably won't last forever you know, just want you to know right. that's kind of like, you don't waste your money if you're not going to be, you know, consider the things that have happened. I think the challenge we have now and we're going to continue to have is for certain patients, implants do really well and teeth don't. You know, if you look at patients that have tons of recession and, you know, rampant decay, you know, but their gums are, or, or let's just not even say they have recession. Let's say they have great quality gums, but they just, they have mm. decay, you know, and they're getting every crown you do, they've got recurrent decay into those, those crowns, whatnot, implants can do really, really well. You know, we got a lot of patients with gum disease though. And it's like, they, they don't realize like implants get gum disease, you know? And and so it it definitely is important to have those conversations. Well, (laughs) any advice that you might have for, so we have a lot of students, uh, a lot of new grads uh, listening in, and even a lot of pre-hygiene students, which are not even in their prerequisites, which is fantastic. Any thoughts, um, to give them some more confidence in their maintenance of dental implants and understanding. So the one big thing I would say is, you know, when you have, and hopefully, hopefully your doctors are willing and maybe these are conversations you have, not the day that you want to do it, but maybe, maybe 
prior to doing it or, you know, or something you should think about whether you're not in high, you know, you're not even there yet or in hygiene school, finding some time to, to go watch. I I wish we're hiring a new hygienist uh, next month and we're going to basically, we're not even going to let her, she's staying, our old hygienist is staying on for basically a month while the new one comes in and we're just going to pay two hygienists for literally like 30 days or a couple of weeks Mm -hmm. just so she can spend adequate time with us, with, with the front office, right. et cetera, is to see how things, how things go. And the, the biggest, one of the biggest reasons of that is I want, want her to understand exactly what we're, we're doing on our side. And so if you're somebody who's you know, wanting to know more about implants or, or be better with implants and how you treat them and how you talk to patients with them, I think the best thing you can do is spend some time watching implants getting placed. I mean, gosh, you can go on YouTube and watch that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and really is trying to see and learn as much of the parts and pieces you can, because then you can have such better conversations about it, you know, and which is going to help with, you know, case acceptance, which is going to help with the patient understanding how to take care of their implant. So I think that's the biggest thing is trying to do whatever you can to educate. So I love it when, I mean, our, 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 our hygienists, a lot of time, whenever they, you know, they have missed patients or, or downtime, they'll just come in and kind of stand over their shoulder and, you know, what are you doing? Or, you know, tell me about you know, this procedure or how you're doing it or, you know, et cetera, because it just, you know, it helps them do their job better too. Have the conversation with the exactly. patient too. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No, that's So, so that's my the biggest advice for sure. I think that's, yeah, that's perfect. Any um, place you want to send anyone if they are interested in learning more, listening to your podcast, going to one of your courses? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, check us out. Millennial Dentist Podcast. The biggest place is probably Instagram. Come follow us on Instagram <laughs> at Millennial Dentist. <laughs> Uh, there's going to be some fun TikTok videos now because that's like my new quarantine thing. So uh, definitely follow follow me there and uh, that'll probably get you to everything else. <laughs> Perfect. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Michelle. As always. I hope you guys enjoyed that because I think he went into such great detail. We had such a good time chit-chatting. I do hope that we get to circle back uh, next year to do a Hinman podcasting booth together. Um, but I'm really bummed that it didn't happen, but I'm glad that we have the opportunity hopefully next year to do something. You know, that's the thing too, is like, I wasn't going to be a Hinman anyway, so I was going to miss seeing him, but I really like of all the people in this world, like I like the frank direct conversations that I get to have with them. Oh, with Sully? Have you ever noticed? Yeah. Have you noticed that? Like I don't know. Maybe I haven't. There's a thing about him. And recently on Facebook, he just messed. Like, I don't necessarily agree with his stance on some of the things, but like he just puts it out there. And I'm like, oh, okay. That millennial in him. That is the millennial. Exactly. Dinner. Like that is such the type of con- or, uh, the type of conversations I like to have where it's like, I'm not, you know, pretense and all of this, like dancing around first to get to the point. I am saying what I'm saying. Like, like, I don't, I, I think like this it. idea is stupid. Let's stop doing it. Or He's very much like, or it. I love this idea. We need to do it more. <laughs> and you're all, you know, he doesn't say it like this, but you are all like behind the times and get up with, you know, the times. Right. Right. His, uh, you place these in- implants without 3D. His, <laughs> cool. his conversations, like with some of the other dental podcasters, his pretty gold. I do need to listen to him because I can only imagine him and T-Bone. Which, they get in. You guys haven't listened to that episode with uh, what is it? What do we have a title for it? Like something like what hygienists are doing wrong or something. Like- yeah, it was something it's pretty something clever along that. Um, it's probably one of our more popular ones last year. Yeah, and he really kind of um, he made excellent points, but in a, a, an aggressive delivery. Like, but that's pretty typical it's, for him. It's a roundabout way of getting to the point, though. Too, it's like let me string you along for forty five minutes, and then I'll give you the real point. <laughs> Well, it was almost the delivery, like he was trying to be divisive, right? Like, right. let me like push your buttons. And then by the end of it, I was like, we freaking agree. You're just being <laughs> an asshole saying it like this. <laughs> it's like you're uh, trying to offend me. And then also I'm being offensive. So I'm not even hearing what you're or offended. So I'm not even hearing what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was good. And you should listen to it. But him, uh, T-Bone and Sully do some stuff together. Yeah. They have some good, good podcasts. Like you guys need to like. Like if you love dental podcasts, like they both have, you know, good, good ones to listen to as well. So. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, we appreciate you guys listening to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists. You are welcome to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and also LinkedIn. We always have giveaways there. You can find really cool information. That's where we also post things like Science Sunday and our chair side chats and maybe some TikTok videos every now and oh, again. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> and you can find us on any of those social media <laughs> It's a low point of our career, right? Right there with TikTok videos. Build up all this credibility. <laughs> and then you do a TikTok video, dashes it all away. And the disappointment is palpable from across the nation. Yeah. Well, I don't hide my expressions on my face. You can find, if you haven't seen that yet, you should head over to Instagram. <laughs> And then email how much you love it to Andrew at a tale of two hygienist.com. And then you can also find us at our website, which is a tale of two hygienist.com. We are super happy that you were here listening. We hope you subscribe. We would always love for you to rate and review us on any of your podcasting apps, especially if you're using Apple podcast. And I think that's it for this week. Anything else? I think that's it. Have a great week, everybody. Yep. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye.